Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Expert Insights, a deep dive into the InHub Annual Report 2022. As we get started and let people into the room, I just want to run through a few ground rules with you first. So moving on to the next slide. So obviously, as you may have noted, we just turned on the recording. This is so that we can offer this after, and we will be sharing this with the recap. Um, you will also have noticed that you're muted and your um, video has been disabled. This is purely so that we can manage the space, but obviously we'd love to ask, for you to ask questions. So please send those via the Q&A function, not via the chat, as those will just go to the panelists. So please send them by the Q&A function, and we'll make sure that we cover those at the end of today's session. So moving on to today's speakers. Today we have Abby Roberts, who is InHope's project manager, and we have Kalina Sogravska, who is head of technology and innovation at InHope. The first half of the presentation will be covered by Abby, and the second half will be covered by Kalina, who will go more into depth uh, with regards to the data that's been covered in this year's report. If you have not already seen the annual report, we'll be putting a link to the copy in the chat. So we'll be sharing that with you shortly. Um, but for the moment, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Abby Roberts. Abby, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I seem to be having some issues with my video, but I will be trying over the next couple of minutes to turn it on. But otherwise, we can begin with the presentation. So for a little bit of background, my name is Abby Roberts, and I am a project manager with InHope, and I have been working for the organization for just under four years at this point in time. I will be giving us a high-level overview of the work of InHope for the past year and the activities we have been engaging in, the successes of the past year, and the projects and partners that have made all of our work over the past year possible. And then I will be handing over to my colleague Kalina Zagrovska to dive into the data for the reports received by InHope member hotlines over the past year and the trends that have been identified therein. So if we could please move to the next slide. Hi, Abby, just one interruption. Sorry, um, Esmeralda, could you just promote Abby and Kalina to uh, hosts? This will allow their video functions to activate. Perfect, thank you so much. And here we both are, hi Kalina. All right, so we can begin with an overview of the role of the hotlines. If you can please move to the next slide. So InHope is the global network combating online child sexual abuse material, which we will be referring to as CSAM throughout this presentation. The InHope network in 2022 consisted of 50 hotlines in 46 countries around the world that provide the public with a way to anonymously report illegal content found online. While the offices of InHope are based in the Netherlands, our member hotlines operate across six continents around the world, in Africa, Asia, Oceania, Europe, and North and South America. Member hotlines receive reports of suspected child sexual abuse material from members of the public. These reports are reviewed by the content analysts of these hotlines who classify the legality of the material, which is then shared with the national law enforcement agencies in their country. And a notice and takedown order is sent to the national hosting provider in the country to ensure that this illegal content is rapidly removed from the internet. InHope as an organization provides hotlines with access to a platform called ICCAM, which is a secure platform that facilitates the exchange of the reports of CSAM between member hotlines across jurisdictions, and also the exchange of this material with our key law enforcement partner, Interpol. The data from these exchanges and the trends identified therein are going to be discussed in the second half of this presentation. If we can pass to the next slide, please. So in January of 2022 marked the start of the first year of the implementation of InHope's 2022 to 2024 strategic plan. We pass to the next slide. 
this strategic plan is focused around achieving our vision of a digital world free of child sexual abuse material. And the strategic plan has a central goal of supporting the people and technology within the InHope network. For people, as a global network, our growth and success is entirely dependent on the professionals within the network. And InHope's key focus as a secretariat is promoting the development of capacity and professional development of all members within the network. And for technology, we need to ensure that the platforms that the platform that we provide to member hotlines for the exchange of this material is updated and usable and uh, changing with the times over the years to ensure that we can exchange and remove this content from the internet as fast as possible. So this strategic plan for these three years is delivered through six organizational pillars. If we can move to the next slide. These pillars are network expansion, strategic communications, capacity building, sustainability, innovation, and organizational excellence. So the key ones you can see on the slide here for network expansion, this is a central goal for the network, given that our vision is a worldwide uh, network to combat child sexual abuse material and our goal is to expand the InHope network globally so that each and every person around the world has access to a mechanism for reporting child sexual abuse material and for this vision to be realized an InHope hotline presence needs to be in every country around the world. For strategic communications, our goal is to increase the profile and awareness of InHope and especially its member hotlines, their role in the national context and how they can support the governments and law enforcement operating within their country, and to highlight the importance of a unified global effort for combating online child sexual abuse material. For capacity building, our goal under this pillar is to increase, uh, to improve the skills and capabilities of the InHope network and the professionals that are operating within the network to ensure we can improve effectiveness and productivity as a network of hotlines, improving the capacity, efficiency, and the uh, interoperability of the network will always result in the faster removal of child sexual abuse material from the digital environment. Under sustainability, the long-term goal for this pillar is to ensure the long-term viability of the InHope network and their member hotlines to promote the role of the hotlines in the global uh, child sexual abuse material fight and to ensure the uh, long-time capacity and relevancy of the hotline model going forward. And lastly, for organizational excellence, the goal is to strengthen and improve the InHope's governance model, which includes updates to InHope's articles of association and the development of organizational priorities based on the needs of the InHope member hotlines. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So this work based on the InHope strategy for 2022 to 2025 is uh, supported by our partnerships and our key projects. So if we can move to the next slide, please. The core work of the InHope Secretariat is covered by a number of different projects, primarily funded by the European Commission and the End Violence Against Children Fund. All of this information and more is available in greater detail on the InHope website, but I'll provide a basic overview of all of the different projects we are currently engaging in that support the activities of the InHope network for the past year. The first and most uh, central project in Hope Work is the Better Internet for Kids program, which is funded by the European Commission under the auspices of DG Connect. This program is uh, run in, in partnership with InSafe, and this is the coordination of the network of safer internet centers throughout Europe. And this program is focused on the capacity building and outreach for the network of hotlines and their safer internet center partners in Europe and on the global stage. Alongside this is the ICCHEM grant, which is focused on the development and maintenance of our technology platform ICCHEM which primarily allows hotlines to exchange these reports of child sexual abuse material across jurisdictions. 
as well as sharing data and tracking statistics. And this project is funded by the European Commission also under the auspices of DG Home. Uh, alongside this is the Stronger Together project, also funded by the European Commission under uh, DG Justice, I believe. And this is a project that is allowing the uh, communications and outreach activities of the InHope network generally to support the development of publications and to promote the unified voice of the InHope network. Uh, to help us combat online child sexual abuse material, also funded by the European Commission under the auspices of DG Justice is the Project Aviator, which aims at developing automation and intelligence tools to reduce the time spent by law enforcement in the processing and the assessing of reports of child sexual abuse material. And InHope is involved generally in the outreach and coordination of the law enforcement involvement within this project. If we can switch to the next slide, please. Outside of the core projects that are funded by the European Commission are the projects that are funded by the End Violence Against Children Fund and Google.org, which is the charitable arm of Google. The two uh, key projects funded by End Violence Against Children are the Global Standard Project and Project Escape. Project Escape is a project that is focused on the network expansion activities of InHope outside of the EU, as well as upgrades to our platform ICCAM and the accompanying tool report box. And this tool report box acts as a, a first step for hotlines looking to accept reports from the public. It is a one-stop shop for a hotline reporting form to allow these uh, prospective organizations outside of the EU to join the network with little necessary technological setup time for the hotline reporting form and report management system. The Global Standard Project has a goal of creating a common schema for the, the classification of child sexual abuse material that will unify the language used in classifying this material relevant to every jurisdiction we are operating in. And the finally, the last project is the uh, network expansion activities done under the google.org or Tides Foundation project. And this project is entirely focused on network expansion outside of the European Union, as well as promoting the regional capacity building activities outside of the European Union. So outside of our project work, if we can switch to the next slide, InHope also works with a number of partners who also support our mission of combating CSAM online and to help grow and support our network of hotlines using this multi-stakeholder approach vital to the InHope strategy. So over the years, InHope has built many partnerships with other NGOs, relevant law enforcement agencies, and particularly tech companies and corporate partners who have become a part of InHope's partnership program. InHope partners support the general sustenance of all of the aspects of the InHope network that helps to enhance the everyday work and capacity of the 200 analysts operating within the InHope network. So if we can switch to the next slide, these are all of InHope's partners that have been incredibly vital in supporting the work of the past year. This is inclusive of the uh, project funding partners, which I have talked about previously, as well as InHope's other partners that have been supporting the work either via funding or via cooperation agreements or engaging in mutual events or advocacy campaigns over the past year. And the work we do is entirely supported by all of the organizations you see on the screen. So with all of this context, I would like to go over the activities of the past year and the successes of the InHope Network in 2022. If we can switch to the next slide, please. And to the next slide, please. So as a global network united against the goal of combating online child sexual abuse material, it is vital that we speak with a united voice and reach as many people as possible 
to promote reporting and to raise awareness around the issues surrounding child sexual abuse material. In 2022, three, over 300 experts from around the world gathered at InHope's annual summit in September, which was held in Washington, DC, with support from Amazon Web Services. And the goal of this summit was to engage with the relevant stakeholders in this field to promote talking about the issues surrounding CSAM. This is a particularly taboo topic and a difficult one to encourage meaningful conversations around. And the goal of the In Hope for the past year has been to provide an avenue for these conversations to take place and to promote these conversations going forward. Also along this topic, last year In Hope held nine expert insights webinars, which brought together a grand total of over 1,000 participants from around the world. And these webinars are held on specific topics relevant to online safety and the work of the hotlines to promote the capacity of the network and to raise awareness around the network activities worldwide and to engage with other stakeholders relevant to combating online child sexual abuse material. So alongside advocacy, the core mission of InHope is encouraging all di digital citizens to report illegal content online and to ensure they have a hotline they can report child sexual abuse material to. And to support this, our network expansion activities as a network play a vital role in achieving this goal. Last year, we set up two hotlines under Project Escape in Serbia and Albania and welcomed them into the InHope network, expanding our total number of member hotlines. Alongside the hotlines, we also welcomed six new funding partners to the InHope partner program, Sepeto, Amazon, Twitch, Grayshift, Tether, and Snap. These partners provide a, a very meaningful support to the mission of InHope and we are I'm very happy to have welcomed them to our partnership program and encourage them to expand their uh, goals to align with the InHope mission. Alongside this, the work of setting up hotlines is a long-term process constantly engaged in by our network expansion team. And for this, we have been working with as many organizations as possible to set up a hotline in every relevant country in the world. And a network expansion team in 2022 have had over 80 meetings with organizations that are interested in becoming a member hotline to support them in engaging in relevant advocacy campaigns in their countries, as well as connecting them with national partners to help set up the hotline in their countries. And lastly, if we can switch to the next slide, please. We engaged in a number of capacity building activities over the past year. This included 11 peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and quality assurance reviews. These were 11 quality assurance reviews conducted by uh, InHope staff for hotlines. And these quality assurance reviews are particularly important for ensuring adequate staff welfare standards are engaged in, in the national hotlines and to ensure that stakeholder support is in place in the country, as well as the relevant data security, physical security and technical security requirements are in place to support the work of the hotline given the sensitive topics. We also welcomed seven new colleagues to the InHope Secretariat as the team has been growing as rapidly as the InHope network generally. And these new colleagues are engaged in the different strategic pillar activities identified earlier in the presentation. Uh, over 2022, we also had 189 participants in the various trainings given by the InHope uh, secretariat over the past year. These included content assessment trainings for law enforcement and analysts, a core training to introduce analysts to the ICCAM platform and its uh, uses, as well as specific trainings on topics identified by the InHope network, such as on how to trace refer websites and technical, uh, technical skills to help analysts in their work of assessing content. 
And lastly, we have been uh, engaged in the creation of publications on various topics relevant to the InHope Network. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we have published a legislative overview for EU hotlines, and this was based on data from 2022 on the legislative environment that all hotlines are operating in. And more information about this overview can be found on the InHope website. We also published a best practice guideline for hotlines and law enforcement on this cooperation to help support the uh, national cooperation for hotlines between their law enforcement partners and the hotline generally. And we also published the Aviator Annual Report, which is an annual review of the Aviator Project. Um, which is focused on the automa automation and processing capabilities of law enforcement partners of reports of child sexual abuse material. And this information is also available on the Aviator website. If we can proceed to the next slide. This is an overview of all of the activities that we have been engaged in in 2022. Most importantly, however, is the exchange of reports received by the public between hotlines of child sexual abuse material. All of our work of capacity building, network expansion, communications and advocacy is centered around eradicating CSAM from the internet. So I will now be passing over to my colleague Kalina Zagrovska to provide an overview of this work related to InHope and the data for 2022. Thank you, Abby, uh, and uh, thanks for the team. Uh, my section will focus mostly on how we extracted this data and how we formed this report in order to represent fairly the exchange that happened during the year of 2022. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? And click through to fill in uh, the diagram. Wonderful. So if we were to follow the journey of a report, it is what you see on this image. A report comes into a, to a country and it follows uh, the same procedure every time. If the content is hosted within the same country, it goes into two branches. First, it's, it is reported to the law enforcement of that country in order for the law enforcement to make their case management, identify offenders and identify victims. Then on the other hand, it is uh, sent to the HP or hosting provider of that country in order for the content to be removed from the internet. However, uh, the simple scenario of country A on the left side almost never happens because uh, uh, internet, the internet is global and um, content is hosted globally. So what usually happens is that a report comes in which is not hosted in the same country where it is reported in. And this is the reason why ICCAM, the system of InHope, exists. It is a system of exchange, which means that the report is exchanged through, through the platform and then forwarded to the hotline in country B where the content is hosted. That means that country B can now follow their process and then on their end forward to law enforcement to do their case management of offenders and victims or uh, and also to hosting providers regarding uh, removing the content as fast as possible. Uh, so in, in this uh, kind of journey of report, uh, the report itself describes a few key items. So if you, and abbreviations, ICCAM, the name of the system is basically means ICCAM, and it was uh, developed over 10 years ago to facilitate the exchange. When we talk about the, the receiving hotline that first initiates the report, we are talking about a reporting hotline and the reporting uh, overviews of um, what are the countries that had reporting uh, represent basically the reporting hotlines. A reporting hotline country B, we refer to these hotlines as hosting uh, uh, hotlines. Uh, uh, on the other side, we have LEA, which means Law Enforcement Agency, and HP, which means Hosting Provider. Uh, apart from uh, the exchange in, the, in terms of the report, we have two auxiliary processes. Everything that is, has made 
uh, a classification of national or baseline is being exchanged every day with Interpol in order for them to manage their own cases on an international level. And on the uh, lower end side, all of the exchanged content is made available for statistics so we can understand what, what was seen in the images, the distribution uh, in terms of geography, the, uh, what is seen in the images in terms of age, uh, gender, where content was found in terms of uh, site types, uh, etc. So we, uh, ICCAM is here to facilitate a global process of hosting that follows a country jurisdiction distribution. Uh, follow to the next slide, please. What we have found this year is that the uh, content uh, exchanged through this report journey was found in 83 hosting countries and processed, uh, uh, processed by 50 reporting countries. That means that uh, when, we, uh, when we develop our organization further, we are focusing on all of those hosting locations which currently do not have a, a hotline and do not have an established, established mechanism for reporting. Uh, every year we see uh, the distribution be becoming more varied and even the main insight from one of uh, from from this report is that distribution is becoming more varied making our uh, task of removal even more difficult move to the next slide please so these are the top level insights what we have found to be true um, and uh, uh, notable for the, the for the previous year the overall total volume exchange has de has decreased we we uh, we have seen over a 40% decrease over what we have seen last year and we have bounded bounded that with the first year that um, covid restrictions were down and that, that the overall internet browsing activity has been down we have used other methods to to uh, isolate the reason for the, this decrease, and they vary uh, uh, across hotlines. Some don't have an indication of why this happened, and some have indication which are very edge-based. For example, in the previous year, they had single reporters um, that were responsible for a multitude of their re reports, and others agree that total reporting in terms of volume is probably connected to uh, the less, less internet activity for the population in general. Then the second insight is that we have a record number of hosting locations. Only two years ago, this number was 49, which means even, uh, uh, even, even more than before, content is hosted uh, globally, and the less, uh, the, the less, the less um, we can close the gap between reporters and how, how many hotlines we have to address the content removal process, the more complexity we will have within the network. And then we have our goal and our vision and mission about removing, removing uh, content as fast as possible. We are, it is not uh, difficult to, uh, to kind of foresee that if we have a record number of hosting locations where we don't have hotlines, the number of removal is uh, decreasing, which means it's harder to do. Move to the next slide, please. I will talk a little bit about uh, the data collection process and how we came to the data that you've seen published. Next slide. Uh, it is important to note what are the boundaries of the data we are seeing and how, how, that, how that is addressed. So what you're seeing is that all content that is created in the year of 2022, that means that this is a hard stop on all data that enters the report. That means that if something was created on the 31st of December of the year, but was then removed on the 1st of January of 2023, that would be counted as a report open, but the removal time would not be uh, adjoined to it. We have a statistic portal that comes from the platform, which, uh, which uh, contains information about reporting, hosting, classification, and metadata. And then we have custom reports that uh, basically take all of this information, uh, follow a standard procedure, and calculate the notice and takedown times, uh, having in, in mind uh, special rules such as removing weekends and counting only working days. The principles of how this data uh, collection is then represented 
uh, is defined in uh, draft versions of text and principles that are made explicit in what we, in in a group that is called the data technology and stats user group we've had five meetings between january and march to establish the uh, body of text uh, of the annual report what you see is basically a bottoms up and a top uh, to bottom approach of gathering data and making sure that uh, everything that is stated as a sentence is referred to and and uh, bound to resources from our members as an example, you would you, you see um, uh, references to publications such as I, I, ICAP sites that were uh, done by one of our members, or other uh, other claims and other resources which were developed developed throughout the year and then referenced throughout the text. And at the end of that process, we have the sixty three uh, page report you are uh, you have hopefully downloaded by this uh, 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 moment. So this is where we are. Uh, next slide, please. In, uh, a review of 2021 basically contains what, what we have been seeing and what is the data uh, com compared to previous years and compared uh, to, uh, to itself. Uh, what is uh, the legend on the right, uh, the colors and the uh, left is basically the four base definitions of what we see in an annual report. Um, it is important to know that we are talking about reports as the first um, uh, units of data that we that the system collects. But when we are comparing uh, items within a report, we, we are talking about exchange content URLs. Why is that? It is because it is difficult to compare one report to another in terms of effort. We are trying to uh, uh, quantify in terms of uh, how, what was the effect on people and what was the effect of technology, our strategic pillars within the year. And it's difficult to do, do that if it's impossible to compare one weight of report with, with another. So that means that every report then is mapped to how many exchange content URLs it has. In other words, a web, a web page is scrapped to its uh, images and videos, and these are called exchange content URLs. The total that was exchanged throughout the years is the, uh, 587, 852. Then we, uh, the known content is everything that was either uh, a URL that was exchanged within the same five days, the same web domain found by two different uh, hotlines or two different members of the public, or something that was previously hash matched to um, Interpol's list or ICCAM's list. Everything that was new is basically everything that was uh, not known and, and exchanged. So known plus new equals the total number. And what was illegal is everything that was classified as uh, images uh, or videos containing actual CSAM. When a report is made, it is possible that the web page uh, itself does not contain only illegal images but uh, the whole report is captured for evidence-based purposes. Move to the next slide, please. Uh, in, in terms of site type, we, we collect uh, statistical information about 10 different uh, site, uh, site types uh, to determine where content is coming from. Uh, by far the largest have been an image host, a website, and forum. Uh, th this is consistent with previous uh, year's data and is not uh, too, um, too different. What is different from this year and ha has been uh, selected as an improvement for, for the following years is that there is a category, category that, that is missing. There is a new category of a website called ICAP, meaning Invite Child Abuse Pyramid Scheme, which basically incentiv incentivizes members to send invites, collecting points, gaining access to CSAM. In, the, in future iterations of ICCAM, this will be added as a new category. And in the following years, we would have statistical representation of a new category. Move to the uh, next slide, please. Then we have collected information about what is the age and gender of victims. This is consistent with the previous years. And in, in, in terms of the age, the majority is uh, prepu prepubescent category. And in, uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, victims, uh, one of our members has um, correctly attributed that this is a gendered crime. So 90% uh, 
of um, victims that picked are female. Next slide, please. Uh, it, 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 since we have 83 hosting locations, it is quite difficult to represent in a, in a, in a page how uh, content, uh, where content is distributed and where, and where illegal content is distributed. So we try to um, make a system that works. So in the angled and uh, patterned, we, you can see where illegal content was found and the colors represent the distribution of where content was found. In both, uh, for both hosting um, patterns, uh, all content exchange and illegal content exchange, uh, the, uh, the Netherlands and USA are over the 10 and over the 15 mark. Uh, as I said, it's over 82 countries, so 83 countries, so the list would be uh, extensive, but the geographical distribution uh, favors the system distribution we've seen uh, from before. One or two countries are um, ha have over 25% of hosting, then five to six countries have between between uh, between 20 and 5%, and the majority of the country have below 1%. Move to the next slide, please. If we were to isolate uh, data patterns regarding Europe, and when we say Europe, we are thinking of uh, countries in the European Union. This is how the map looks, and this is what I've described. So you could see two countries uh, above 20%, uh, uh, seven countries which are uh, between one and, uh, and uh, 20%, and the rest below 1%. Next slide, please. In terms of the reporting data, the situation is similar. If you see the worldwide uh, um, map, you can see uh, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands uh, be, both having 53% and the rest of the countries, uh, six or seven countries within the 10, 10 uh, to 1% and then uh, the others less than 2.5 uh, and less than 3.5%. Uh, it is important to note that also not all reporters are the same. So what you're seeing here is a mix of countries with different jurisdictions and different rights. From our 50 members, um, five have the um, uh, capability to also seek out reports and not wait for a citizen to report. So that means that reporting data doesn't, uh, also uh, includes data that is uh, the result of hotlines seeking out content. So this obviously influences the amount of data that they can enter. Moving to the next slide, please. And at the end, uh, we, we always want to see how fast we have achieved our mission, how fast we have removed content. So in, in the case of the journey of the report, we have indicated three key uh, actions. How fast have we, re uh, uh, how many of the reports were removed within the same day to, the, to law enforcement, to hosting provider, and removed? As you can see, the, the, this um, slide uh, slider basically decreases as the uh, report progresses, and the situation is similar for the European breakdown. Can we move to the next slide? Uh, the the uh, situation is quite similar. Uh, even even a little bit decreased. This is due to the same um, reason I've indicated. Basically, uh, the five hotlines that can uh, remove and seek out content everywhere have have been uh, volunteering to take on the work of removing uh, content in countries where we don't have a hotline. So that means that the hosting country, the thirty three hosting countries where we don't have a, a hotline, have been basically addressed by these five countries where we don't have established re uh, relationship with law enforcement and we don't have established relationships with hosting uh, partners. That, that means in turn that it's been difficult to remove content, which obviously influences content removal times. Moving to the next slide. So in summary, uh, I've, exp uh, I've went through uh, a couple of infographics and I've explained a, a couple of, you know, uh, footnotes on each of them, ex explaining how how something should be interpreted, what are the special use cases, what is the distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if if we were to summarize how you can uh, use the annual report, 
If you were to download it, uh, we, we would urge you to, to uh, use it in its full form. Not only use the graphics, uh, but also rely on context that is just as important as, as the data. We have made great efforts to bring clarity which, with how we form the text itself. And the text itself is just as important um, in the data. So if we were to summarize, the narrative text holds the full story that the data tells. That is just a, a kind of a caveat, a caveat of how to use it. Uh, next slide, please. At the end, we have um, basically a, a sentence that we always refer back to on why, why we do what we do and why we exist. And uh, a common sentence is that the role of hotlines is diverse in nature. However, every activity is linked to either people or technology. So with this, I'm going back to how, where this presentation started in terms of strategic direction. Our key pillars of uh, who we want to support are people and uh, basically the analyst professionals to be aided by technology. And the key uh, words that describe our mission are support and enable. And if you were to make a really, really qu quick uh, uh, calculation of what, what, you, what you saw as a top line number and our number of analysts. So we have over a half a million total exchange reports uh, being addressed by a little over 200 analysts. That, and in the past year, in 2024, we've had about 254 working days. So that means roughly uh, each analyst, uh, each professional that is part of the network has been responsible for over 2,000 report, 2,000 content items being analyzed, seen for the first time, and taken down. I just wanted to make sure that we center the people who are responsible for this amazing impact throughout the year and make sure that they have the recognition and the praise that they absolutely deserve. So InHope has been uh, immensely proud to be part of their support and will continue to support them throughout. Me and Abby are uh, both here to address any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Kalina. Yes, yeah, so we asked some questions through the chat. I just wanted to ask first, um, with regards to how the, the data has been collected and changed over the years, obviously, um, how comparable then is, is this year's data to data, let's say, from 2019 and 2020? Um, I would uh, in two, in 2020 is when we made uh, a major um, uh, re rehaul of how we calculate the data. The data from 2020 onwards uses the same de uh, definitions for the four main terms. So the data is comparable from uh, from then in terms of the main terms. However, uh, the uh, uh, factor that influence uh, the data itself and the removal times are. Uh, uh, the differences in um, in environments such as deciding to take on uh, reports in countries where we don't have a hotline, which can only be addressed by having the full context in the narrative text. Yeah, yeah I think that's a use, really important one because I feel like that's obviously something that sometimes we see happen and obviously with the numbers changing throughout the years and sometimes the process changing, it's uh, it's an important one to remember that a global organization has a lot of countries to work with. Um, going further into the chat, uh, we have a question. Does InHope also maintain the database of the website URLs that need to be blocked and communicate with the other organizations? Um, uh, InHope does have uh, a database of website URLs, but they are currently not sh shared with any third parties. Uh, basically, every member organization that is part of InHope um, joins with what we call an ICCAM participation agreement, uh, specifying that the data uh, belongs to them, belongs to the member organization. That means that InHope uh, uh, shares the URLs with Interpol, so that, that can become uh, a part of IWAL, but it, it doesn't uh, share uh, information about the URLs for, with any other third-party organization. Exactly. So there's absolutely no ownership of data from the in-house side. No. no. Could you then uh, just also explain and elaborate on the fact that when you say one item of CSAM, are you talking about one website, one image, one video? And what is your philosophy of quantifying CSAM? 
Uh, thanks for this question, uh, Eckhart. Um, so when we talk about one item, we talk about one single uh, URL containing one file. So that would that would mean uh, basically uh, one one URL containing one file. That is that is the definition, and that is what we are counting towards. And in terms of, of uh, quantifying, we have four um, categories of classification. One of them is to mark the uh, file as baseline according to the Interpol classification. The second one is to to uh, uh, classify it as nationally nationally illegal. The, the third is to classify it as doubtful, meaning the analyst is not sure whether this contain, contains e, uh, uh, CSAM according to the hosting country definition. And the second one uh, is uh, marked as ignore, meaning content is legal. It is either a logo or just legal content and needs to be ignored by the system in further um, further processing. And could you elaborate a bit more on the the way the classification process works? Is this um, is this also linked to to, to training? And uh, is there going to be any changes made in the way classification is done? Is there anything we can expect to change in twenty twenty three? Yes, absolutely. So um, two uh, two explanations due on that one. Uh, there are two modes of how currently classification is being made. One of them is just by logging in into the icam.net website and uh, choosing the classification for each image and uh, accord, uh, along with all statistical information, uh, age, gender, and everything I've presented. A second method is using uh, an API, meaning that the hotline has their own system of uh, classifying and recording statistical information, but then that data is synced through an API, meaning application programming interface to ICCAM and then recorded. But what we uh, kind of um, ha had a problem with in terms of comparing and what has not been comparable is uh, that national, nationally illegal classification. So what is illegal in one country may not be illegal in another country. And what constitutes uh, illegality uh, uh, what was not possible to be compare, compared. So as part of uh, you know, addressing this problem, uh, we have the global standard project mentioned by Abby briefly, where we are De developing a global classification schema to describe every field and every uh, possible um, uh, uh, combination of how a national nationally illegal classification can be made. That is a lot of verbiage, a lot of words to basically describe that we will have a universal way of recording what is present in an image and also what is the uh, formula that equals to uh, a nationally illegal classification. In uh, in uh, July, we'll be rolling out an integration according to the global classification schema, which means ICCAM through the UI, through, through the website, will we'll be able to record these um, new fields and classifications. And uh, hotlines using their own systems would also be able to contribute based on the mapping that we uh, uh, do in the interim period. I think it's a really interesting one to add. I'm just going to pop two links into the chat. So if anyone who's interested in learning more and understanding a bit more about what global standard is and how it's going to work, it's a fascinating project and it really stands uh, stands ahead for the type of alignment that's required. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, so, oh, it's a three-pronged question. So starting mm -hmm. ahead. Um, first question is the ICPS pyramid scheme content type. Are you referring to Telegram? Uh, in, in this case, uh, not not referring to uh, to Telegram. Uh, this is based on the um, IWF um, uh, research, and we can share uh, we can share the research after the after the. Um, uh the session but basically it's a special uh form of website that uh, includes kind of affiliate codes and uh and uh, adding points and things like this if this is one that people are more interested in we can also go have do a little bit of a deep dive and write something about it that we can also put out to clarify what this type of content type is then the follow-up question to that is do you have stats on baseline categorization uh, we we don't yeah. have stats uh, specifically on baseline cat categorization. Everything that is known is a, a sum of uh, all known content that has been mapped, and um, as well as all URLs that were uh, uh, copies that were pre uh, uh, 
uh, process in the previous period. So we don't uh, specifically have uh, stats on the matches. If you're talking, Tiana, if you're uh, uh, asking specifically about how much uh, of the proportion of uh, illegal has been baseline, uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but uh, it is common for for hotlines, especially large hotlines that use the API, to basically hard code everything as nationally illegal. So the proportion of baseline is um, uh, less than the, the, the sum of everything that was marked national currently. Thank you, Helena. And then the final question is when you talk about known images, so this is based on the hash match specifically, every time the hash, uh, the match is basically roughly the same content, but it has a different hash code, would it be then new material? Uh, yes, so we are we are talking about counting hash mashes according to the strict hash language, SHA-1. So that means that even if the uh, image is uh, off by one pixel, different by one pixel, we, it is counted as a new image. Uh, we are aware of the technical limitation of using uh, this uh, hash language, and we are looking into uh, developing more te techniques for detection, including perceptual ha hashing like photo DNA. But currently, everything that is uh, marked as known is basically um, strict hash match to SHA-1 uh, hashing language. Yeah, exactly. So even that one pixel off, it changes it, which is really, really interesting how that's been used. Um, so uh, the final question that we have has come through is regarding mentioning that reporting to hotlines has decreased through the years. So what do you think the effect is going to be with regards to end-to-end -end encryption on that decrease? And they're asking because obviously the hot topic before the EC with the last proposal of combating CSAM and the fact that the proposal is going to infringe on privacy rights of users, including children. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. It is always difficult when we have a major decrease or a major increase to uh, isolate the reasons, especially because the reasons might be edge cases. Like we have uh, asked the question uh, to, to our hotlines when we were processing the data about what the reasons were, and some were edge cases. Some some would, were saying that they have a single, what they call vigilante reporter, that used to report 300 euros uh, a week, but it's now nowhere to be seen. So that is a reason for, for a decrease. Others have other um, kind of reasons for decrease. What I can say is that end-to-end -end encryption and what is coming down that pipeline doesn't seem to uh, kind of have any, have any effect um, uh, given the profile of the data. So if you uh, kind of look at the site type, uh, social media and existing platforms and, and big companies are not even in the, in the top five uh, in the distribution, the top five are, uh, websites. Uh, so I don't expect that even uh, even if all big companies uh, um, uh, start using end-to-end -end encryption, we would have a major decrease in, in terms of reporting. Of course, to be seen. Yeah, I think there's going to be more to come from InHope with regards to the uh, perspective yep. and view on the position for end-to-end -end encryption. But I think that's probably coming within the next few months. So it'd be interesting to follow up on that one. Interesting topic. Um, next thing I've just had in the chat is, um, can you share the research of the IWF? I'm looking for a deep dive scheme and we've seen links to Telegram. I'm not really sure the relevancy here, but then um, Abby's already shared the link through that's specifically linked to the IWF. So I think that clarifies that one. So the final thing that I wanted to ask uh, to Abby is obviously you spoke a lot about what we have done with regards to projects and activities. Is there anything you'd like to really highlight on what we are going to do? Because we're already in 2023 uh, and this report is really focused on the activities that happened in 2022. Yes, definitely. I think I can highlight a number of key activities that are going to be coming down the lines for us. I think as a, a participant in the chat has already pointed out the very exciting times we are all experiencing in the EU with the upcoming legislative proposal. I think the advocacy efforts of the network going forward for this proposal and for complementarity with national legislation is going to be a major activity for InHope going forward. And I think for all members hotlines and the secretariat acting as a unified voice in advocacy efforts over the next uh, five or six months for the the network 
with this upcoming legislation is going to be a key activity. As Kalina and myself have both highlighted, the Global Standard Project is going to be groundbreaking for the network and for uh, unifying us in the fight against CSEM. We have uh, created and launched this schema already, which has been uh, put in the chat information about, and we are currently in the testing phase and implementation phase for this schema, which is this universal language for the classification of child sexual abuse material. This also feeds into the advocacy efforts that we're currently engaging in as one of the complex realities of being a network of our nature is the fact that all member hotlines are operating in different jurisdictions and all different jurisdictions. There are different legislations governing child sexual abuse material and how it is defined and dealt with in the national context. And our role as a global network is to unify our efforts to operate in all of these jurisdictions. And the Global Standard Project is one of the key activities to facilitate this because this schema, which is the universal classification schema, is aligned with all of the jurisdictions that hotlines are currently operating and uh, unifies and harmonizes the terminology that is used in child sexual abuse material legislation and how it is referred to in the different legislations. So this integration of the schema into our platform ICCAM this year and hotlines beginning the annotation efforts based on this schema is going to be a big thing coming down the line. And then I think lastly, our perpetual goal of network expansion has never been more important and is never ha has never been a bigger focus. I think with the expansion of the in-hope secretariat uh, capacity, we are now engaging in more and more uh, efforts on the national and regional level to expand the in-hope network to the key identified areas by the network where we think in-hope hotlines need to be present. And we're focusing very, very strongly on Southeast Asia, on Africa and Latin America. So I think over the next eight months or so, these network expansion activities are going to be a highlight and a huge priority for us as a secretariat, as a network and as a global community. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, I think it's also interesting. I and mean, we say we cover a lot of jurisdictions, but you have to think right now that's 48 different types of legislations in place, cultures in place, communication styles across the board. So it's a really complicated one to be involved in. And then we um, sent through here just now the uh, joining our mailing list. So obviously, Abby spoke specifically about updates for global standards. But if you sign up to our mailing list and if you did not come through this webinar today, via that mailing list, we highly recommend that you do sign up. We mainly focused on highlighting specifically the events we're doing, the projects we're doing, and then keeping you informed of any other activities, for example, announcement on the annual report. Um, so we, we highly recommend that you sign up to that if you want to stay in the loop and hear what's more to come. We'll obviously be announcing and releasing more information on the two hotlines that we uh, just welcomed, Argentina and Moldova, and the activities uh, that they do in their countries right now. So that's quite exciting. Um, but for the moment, I'd really like to thank our two speakers, uh, Abby Roberts and Kalina Zagraska, for taking the time to run through the annual report with us today and explaining the details and nuances of how InHope does the reporting each year. Obviously, this is a once a year event, so um, we look forward to you joining next. But if you are interested in additional topics, we will be hosting our next webinar next week which is understanding gaming nuances to protect youth audiences online. Um, we felt today as well that we get a lot of signups last minute. So we highly recommend that if you're interested in this topic at all to um, sign up sooner rather than later so you don't miss your opportunity. Um, we hope you really enjoyed today's session and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much to the speakers. Bye. <laughs>